So I'm here today to talk about hacking HTML emails with CSS and all the amazing things you can do with it. So I'm Kevin Mandeville. Used to do web design, and now I do strictly email design. So I converted to the dark side, and I'm here to tell you all about it. Uh, I do that at Litmus. We're an email testing and analytics company. So you can see what your email looks like in over 50 different email clients uh, as you're testing. It's like a browser stack for HTML email clients. So you guys remember the browser wars? Fun times, right? Remember that? Well, I'm here to introduce you to the email client wars, which is not that much better, because there are hundreds of email clients, there's no standards, and next to no official documentation whatsoever. Uh, it's kind of like living in Mordor, and I've been waiting to use that transition forever. So, <laughs> so just to give you an idea of the state of the industry right now, every single month at emailclientmarketshare.com, we at Lemus post the top 10 most used email clients that we gather from our own customer data. We track over a billion email opens a month. And the stat that I want to point out today is the rendering engine market share. 52% is WebKit right now, 25% belongs to Gmail, 13% Outlook, and then it gets super fragmented down to 10% for everybody else that adds up to it. But when you look at it, WebKit, Outlook, and Gmail, those three buckets add up to 90% of the market share. So all of our audiences are probably different, but their variance is between these three categories. And if you get a firm grasp of the rendering in these three categories, you can really tackle HTML email. So for Outlook, basics for those of you who don't know, and please, for anybody who didn't clap when they said they haven't built an HTML email, basically, watch on them. They might hyperventilate about this. But Outlook 2000 to 2003 uses Internet Explorer, and it goes by whichever was installed on the machine. So we're typically talking Internet Explorer 6 or 7. And then it got even better because Outlook decided to upgrade to Microsoft Word as a rendering engine for 2007 to current day, which is still in effect on their Windows uh, products. So yes, they're using Microsoft Word to render HTML and CSS currently. But they also have WebKit for Outlook for Mac and their mobile apps on iOS and Android. So uh, it's a mixed bag for Outlook rendering. The key takeaway is that you need to use tables because of the Microsoft Word rendering engine in Outlook. So you need at least somewhere in your email at least one table to get it to render properly. And, and we can thank Outlook for that. Gmail, until recently, actually wasn't much better. This is a lovely flowchart that showcases the nine different types of accounts across three different types of rendering for Gmail. Uh, and I call this BCSS because this was before they supported embedded CSS, which wasn't until recently. So this level one over here is basically uh, minimal inline CSS that it supports. It doesn't even support things like background. Uh, level two gets a little bit better with inline support. And then level three, it does have uh, some hacks that you can get more things to work with. Uh, but until recently, we've needed to inline styles, CSS styles, because of Gmail, because they did not support embedded CSS. And this was the, the major client that was a big holdout on that. But I'm happy to say, two months ago, Gmail officially launched support for embedded CSS and media queries. And I don't know about y'all, but I was fangirling a little bit over this. Uh, it was a pretty big deal. Um, they had a great blog post about it, and they are the first official uh, major email client to release CSS documentation. They don't have HTML documentation, but they actually released CSS documentation, which is a great step forward. And then WebKit, there's not too much to discuss here. It's not exactly the same WebKit you're going to see in a browser. But for all intents and purposes, it's a good WebKit rendering engine. There's some differences, like there, there's no support for viewport height and some more modern things. Uh, but the WebKit rendering engines in the families of Apple Mail, iOS Mail, very, very good. Uh, and they're the best rendering engines there is. OK, so now that we sort of have that background covered, let's actually dive into some uh, examples here. I really love talking about the layout hacks we've done in HTML email. We've figured out how to do responsive email without media queries. So the basic concept that you want to do is you want to have a fluid to fix layout structure. So you want to start at a fluid 100% full width for mobile for clients that don't support media queries. And then you want to scale that up and constrain it for the desktop. Uh, so in this example, we'll use 600 pixels. So in CSS, it's really simple, right? If you just have a basic div, even if you wanted to define the width, you could define it at 100% and then constrain it with a max width of 600 pixels. But our good old friends at Outlook do not support the box model. So they don't understand uh, widths on divs because of the Microsoft Word rendering engine. But 
what they do have, how many remember the uh, Internet Explorer reset style sheets you could use, yeah? Well, there's still that conditional comment, but there's actually a conditional comment you can use for Microsoft Outlook, if MSO. And this is magic. Every single version of Outlook from 2000 to 2016 has their own version number, and you also can use less than or greater than uh, conditions along with it. So you can target groups. So you can do things like if MSO 12, and that's going to target only 2007. If you did if GTE MSO 12, that's going to target Outlook 2007 and above, so basically the entire Microsoft Word rendering engine. So we can do this to solve our layout problems by wrapping our div in a conditional Outlook table. So it only appears for Outlook and nothing else, and we can move to more semantic HTML email. Uh, I use if GTE MSO 9, so that's all of the Outlooks plus the combinator with Internet Explorer just as a catch-all. But that's just for one column. What if you want to get multiple columns, right? That was easy. We're getting a little bit more complex. There's several solutions. I'm going to go over one today. It's called the Fab Four technique. Uh, this was developed by Remy Parmentier. He's a French email developer. Couldn't be here today, but amazing. You should absolutely follow him. So this relies on the premise of min width, width, and max width, and which wins out when you use all three values. So in this example here, when we have a min width of 160, a width of 380, the width is going to win because it's larger than the min width but smaller than the max width. If we were to swap this so the width was 480 and max width was 320, the max width would win because it's larger than the min width but smaller than the width. And then finally, if we put the min width at 480, the min width would win because it's bigger than the width and the max width. This is what, and this should be inline, but this is what a Fab Four uh, property would look like for a column that we want. We would display inline block so we can mimic floats to have things stacked next to each other if we want. We're going to have min width and max width as fluid percentages. And then the width, we're actually going to use calc. Uh, and here's what these properties mean. Min width is actually going to be the column widths you want for desktop. Max width, the column widths for mobile. And width is basically going to be used to determine which one wins out. We're simply using that equation to determine a min width or max width winner. So the calc we use for width in the equation is the sum of the breakpoint value minus 100% times the breakpoint. So let's take a look at uh, an actual example. If we have a parent container of 500 pixels, that's going to be 250 pixels for the min width, 500 pixels for the max width, and for the width, that 100% is going to be the 500 pixels, which, which comes out to negative 9,600. In this case, the min width wins because it's smaller than the max width but larger than the width, and we get a two-column layout. If we were to do a 400 pixel, the min width will be 200 pixels, the max width 400 pixels, and the width comes out to 38,400. 38, and the max width wins because it's larger than the min width but smaller than the width. So we get a one-column layout here if we were to use this uh, Technique. Are we having fun yet? Uh, this is what it fully looks like to accommodate for some email hacks. I'm not going to go through all that today. Uh, you can read the blog post for more in-depth uh, sort of hacks around it, but this is what it'll look like for the final expression to deal with some uh, rendering limitations. But let's get into some more fun stuff. So what can be dynamic in email? I want you to think about that question as I go through this section. Uh, one of our most famous examples we've used at Limus is we actually use the live Twitter feed in an email. So uh, Kino is crashing with this video, so I just had to give a still image. But it was basically an animated Twitter feed that just kept scrolling with new tweets as it popped in. We had 15 tweets uh, and only five visible, and then sort of scrolled them down one by one. So I want to look at the actual composition of a single tweet and what it looks like. Here's what the HTML looks like for that tweet. There's no text. It's all using empty HTML tags. And what we did was, is we made every single piece of copy its own div and used the content CSS property to fill in the text here for all of the different uh, areas. Uh, so it's not actual text, it's CSS content. It draws elements onto the page. And this is what's going to help make this dynamic for us. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait, we just went over this whole width stuff. There's no way content is supported when widths aren't. And you're right. But we're only going to use this in certain clients. 
And this is my favorite hack of all time. Had to give a little slide to hype it up beforehand. Uh, it's what I've been famous for popularizing in email. The single greatest media query ever created is WebKit targeting. So if you use at media screen and WebKit min device pixel ratio of zero, any CSS inserted into that media query will only be enabled for WebKit clients, which means we can have seamless progressive enhancement for HTML email. So let's take that CSS, wrap it in that media query, and then we're going to put it into its own CSS file, uh, external style sheet. Again, because it's WebKit, 58% of clients actually do support external style sheets. And we hook up the Twitter API to that style sheet to pipe in the data to those CSS uh, uh, classes, essentially. And then for non-WebKit, what we did was is we took that Twitter feed, put it on its own web page, and dynamically captured an image. So even if you were using a client like Outlook, you were still able to take part in the Twitter feed. You just didn't necessarily have the nice animation or responsive uh, design that went with it. So again, WebKit, we had dynamic external CSS. Non-WebKit, we used a dynamic image. Uh, and this was a, a fantastic hit for us as we launched our conference. We had seven, over 750 tweets in 24 hours. Over 60% of the recipients had the email open longer for longer than 18 seconds. So this was great. Uh, and by the way, this is we, we have a Heroku app, simple one-click deploy. You can do exactly what we did here available to you. One of my favorite areas to talk about is interactive email and all of the cool things that are starting to happen here and using click events uh, only with HTML and CSS. And the way in which we can do that is we can use the checkbox and radio buttons hack. So if you use the label tag and then you nest an input with the type of checkbox or radio, along with the check pseudo selector, you can mimic a click event simply with HTML and CSS. So here's an example of what basic checkbox hack looks like. If we just take a simple box and we change its color from blue to red, uh, you can see what the input is like, but even if the input, if we hit it, it would still behave in that way. Uh, so the simple code for something like this is if you have your label on the right with the HTML, uh, your input, and then whatever the content below that is going to be what's associated uh, with that input. And you can use a CSS to have a, the check state along with it, and then you typically use uh, the adjacent sibling selector a lot with interactive email uh, for targeting. So this is what just the basic, basic checkbox hack looks like. Uh, here's an example that uh, we used at Litmus uh, with the checkbox hack. We created a full product tour inside of an email. This was for Litmus Builder, our own sort of editor IDE for email design and development. And we used it to highlight the core features when we launched the product. And this all happened right inside the email. This took 16 checkboxes. And this is where I pretty much lost all my hair, I think. Um, but the end result is pretty cool to see it working uh, in an email. For radio buttons, this is great for interactions like carousels, where only one option selected at a time is going to be essentially active and present. Uh, so Nest has some of my favorite examples of image carousels. Uh, they have a gorgeous product, uh, great to look at here. By the way, I have all the links to the code for all these emails, so you can check them out after the fact, no problem. Mark Robbins, he's the godfather of interactive email, as I've dubbed him. He's really the one pioneering in this space absolutely need to follow him and what he's doing. Uh, he created the most insane email I've ever seen. He created a fully interactive shopping cart experience inside an email that used 117 checkboxes. You could see different product images. You could, see, you could choose color, size. You could add to cart, add and remove quantities. It used CSS counters to dynamically update the pricing. It even had credit card information stored in there. Now, this is only a demo. It wasn't live in production. But this is where things can actually go in email and, and things are actually possible right now. He dubs this technique, once you get up to that type of scale, punch card coding. Because when you look at the form inputs, it looks like an old punch card. Uh, and you can see how complex some of the, the CSS declarations get, where you have things like A1 checked, B2 checked, C9 not checked, et cetera. But he's come up with this systematic way to apply this styling. And it's absolutely amazing. It's the most incredible thing I've seen with HTML and CSS myself. And interactive email with the checkbox and radio uh, button hack has 61% support in email clients right now because it goes even beyond just WebKit. It has a little bit better support. So these things are possible. Uh, 
Target, the target pseudo selector doesn't work quite yet. I'm hopeful that it will soon. Unfortunately, it triggers two clicks in the WebKit clients right now, one for focus and one to sort of activate the event. So I'm hoping that'll make things a little bit easier than the old checkbox and radio buttons hack too. But I just want to show, I mean, creativity, it comes from constraint. We're doing all of these things just with HTML and CSS. There's a lot you can do in email. And the ones who've really been the most limiting factor has been ourselves from not trying or not experimenting. So I'm here today to ask you to please join the revolution. I went to the dark side, it's not that bad. Um, there's so much to do. I think we're only scratching the surface of what we can do. It's really a ton of fun and it's so adventurous to me. I'm having a blast. So I'm here today to really invite the web developers and designers because that's where I came from and I really want more of this community to be involved because you're the one with the front end knowledge to really take email to the next level. Uh, so you can check all my slides and resources, litmus.com slash LP slash dot CSS. But I have a bunch of resources that I wasn't able to cover today and I'm so thankful for having you having me here to let email crash with you guys for a day. So thank you very much. Yeah.